Hey there, and welcome back to Utility Sports. We have a really great video for you today. We have a post-trade deadline mock draft. This is a full first round mock draft, and we're really excited to present this to you. A lot of shakeups, a lot of trades, and a lot of different things that are happening with the mock, uh, considering different positional needs, uh, draft picks shifting places. So there's so much to dig into. So let's go ahead and get started. Now, this is a really exciting mock draft because there has been so much change. That's what we really like, and that's what makes mock drafts super, super exciting. And with the first overall pick, we have the Detroit Pistons. Sheldon, I know uh, you're cautiously optimistic about where this roster is. Uh, where do you see them going at pick one? Cautiously optimistic is a great way to put it there, Austin. <laughs> Simply looking at this uh, roster, I really like Kate Cunningham. Uh, and the rest of it, I'm a little iffy on. You know, Sadiq Bey, I believe in. Jeremy Grant, I think they should have explored trades with him. I think uh, sending him to Brooklyn would have made sense for the two first they got from Philadelphia. Uh, they chose not to do that. They chose to hold on to him. They believe a 28-year-old fits well with their 20-year-olds. Uh, and that's their decision there. That's Troy Weaver doing his best work. But uh, at this point, I think uh, if they do get lucky in the lottery, land first overall again this year, they are going to have a really great option here that's going to fit well long-term with them. And that's going to be Jabari Smith here, the forward out of Auburn. Uh, he's a very special prospect and someone who I think uh, offensively could really unlock what this Pistons team can be. He could be a perfect running mate in the pick and roll and pick and pop game with Cade Cunningham. And he's also someone who can take an offense on his own. Uh, he's going to be a phenomenal mid-range scorer, someone who can pull up from three and has a lot of defensive potential as well. Yeah, so looking at that selection, uh, would you say overall that that that's far and away the best fit, or do you think there's somebody that could be in consideration there fit-wise? Uh, for for them, I think they would look at uh, someone like Chet Holmgren. The one thing I'm excited to see is what Marvin Bagley looks like. I expect him to play a lot of center minutes for that Pistons team, so maybe if Marvin Bagley does impress in his early tenure there in Detroit, that maybe we don't have to consider a center. Chet Holmgren would make some sense for them in terms of giving them a, a freak athlete who can bring the ball up the floor at seven feet, protect the rim. Uh, he would make sense, but I, I do think Jabari Smith right now is probably the top dog in this year's draft. Looking at number two, we have the Orlando Magic, a team that's really trying to search for their true identity, looking for that star player to lead this franchise to the promised land and really get into that postseason. Now they have a really great opportunity. There's a lot of talented players still on the board here. As you've mentioned previously, this is a really, really deep draft and also top heavy draft in terms of this, the star player potential that's here. Who fits best into this timeline? When you look at Orlando, uh, I know they brought in Bull Bull in a trade, uh, but I do not think that actually factors into anything uh, what this team's going to do. Uh, I like what they have in Wendell Carter, but I think that they're going to try and find someone who fits uh, along with their roster. And you have to look at guard Jalen Suggs and who fits better with him than his high school teammate and the guy who followed him to Gonzaga. That's Chad Holmgren. I see him going second overall in this mock draft to Orlando because he's someone who, with Wendell Carter there, you could have a, a rare and unique combination of twin towers, uh, both at seven feet tall, both can protect the rim, both can step out to the three-point line. Uh, and then Chad Holmgren gives you a little bit more dynamism with the ball in his hands, can push it in transition, has good playmaking feel, and I think is gonna be someone who, in the half court offensively, is going to be a very special player. Uh, and then when you look at what he's also going to be uh, on the defensive end, he's someone who's going to be able to hedge out on screens, can play the power forward spot next to Wendell Carter. But I think really where he becomes special is in his minutes at center, uh, which being next to Wendell Carter, you get some uh, some security in case he's not ready to do that right away because of his frame. Uh, but I do really like this for Orlando. Yeah, you have to love this for the Orlando team. You know, they pair up Suggs and Holmgren, two guys that went to high school together. I incredible storyline if that's what happens. Number three, we have the Houston Rockets, obviously a team that is headed uh, by Jalen Green. And you, you have to consider where they're at right now. They, they have some talented players on the roster, some young talent. However, they're you know, really struggling right now. Um, it, it's hard because it, it's a lot of young players on this team, uh, not so much that veteran presence currently. Uh, so what can they add here to really push them forward? This is gonna be an example of uh, the fact that this is a mock draft that I think is going to happen. Uh, with the way the draft currently sits and with where the prospects are currently ranked uh, amongst GMs and executives, not exactly what I would do here because I think they would opt for Paulo Boncaro, a six foot ten freshman forward from Duke, uh, has a really good skill set in the mid-range area, and I think they do need more offensive help. Uh, but my issue is I don't see Kevin Porter Jr. as a long-term starting point guard. Uh, I think that experiment has kind of come and gone. Uh, we've seen some struggles with it. Now he's got playmaking and ball handling skills, don't get me wrong, 
but playing the point guard position in the NBA is a little bit more of a different task uh, and a little bit more difficult than just being able to dribble uh, and play make a bit. Uh, and I think that is something that uh, is holding Houston back, but I don't think they'll address that. I think they're going to keep KPJ there. I think Raphael Stone wants to toy around with that a little bit longer, and Paulo Boncaro is going to be the beneficiary of that here in Houston. Now, Boncaro could be a really, really nice player for Houston. And now we have Oklahoma City, and there's one more prospect that you'd probably consider that blue chip guy uh, in Jaden Ivey still sitting here, but they are kind of guard heavy right now. You have Giddy and you have Shea Gilgis Alexander. Do you think, you know, you can add a guy like Ivy and, and it'll work? I mean, that's it's a really tough call. You want more wings on this roster, but uh, Ivy's still kind of sitting here staring you right in the face. He is. And this is uh, where you get into a little bit of a difficult path here because you look at Orlando. I passed on Jaden Ivy because they have a ton of guards. You look at Houston, they feel pretty confident in the guards they have. Now you get to Oklahoma City here and you have Shea, you have Josh Giddy, you also drafted Trey Mann. They, I know they like Teo Maladon a little bit as well. So it's hard. You take Jay Ivey if you believe he's the best player on the board. They need to. To me, he's the second best player in the class, arguably the best player in the class. He is very, very reminiscent of John Morant. Uh, and I don't say this lightly, guys. I really be feel like he could be the best player in this class when it's all said and done. And if you're Oklahoma City and everything you're doing is about trying to get the best player available, get talent, you have to take him here. I don't care about the fit. He's electric. He's going to be dynamic getting downhill. He's extremely fun to watch, which gives a lot of entertainment value to a young Oklahoma City team uh, to help put fans in the stands. And I also think at the end of the day, you try and reroute everything. They have enough flexibility where they could move on from guys uh, to, to, to try and really build a roster. But at this point, Sam Presti's in talent acquisition mode. Yeah, absolutely. You have to, especially with a talent deficit that you do have. Um, you know, they have a lot of draft picks they can swing on. And, and like you said, this roster can be fluid. Guys like Trey Mann can be moved later on if you're looking to acquire a wing and maybe make something happen there. And now we sit here at number five and we have the Indiana Pacers, another team that's yeah, turning a new leaf. The Sabonis era is completely over. Uh, they added Tyrese Halliburton, going to be a great building block for this team heading into the future. Uh, Sheldon, first speak to, do you like what the Pacers have done uh, over the last couple of months? And then also, where do you see them going? Yeah, Pacers fans, leave a like on today's video because you guys are one of the big winners of the NBA trade deadline. Uh, the fact that you were able to uh, swindle Tyrese Halliburton from the Indiana, uh, from the Sacramento Kings, excuse me, uh, was huge. Just because uh, not very often does a 21-year-old averaging 15 points and seven assists come along and he's going to be a perfect fit next to Miles Turner. I love the fact that they held on to Miles Turner, given the fact they were able to grab Tyrese Halliburton. They also maximized Karis LeVert's value, grabbing a first round pick for him and an early second. Uh, I think they did about as well as they could. They have a lot of flexibility going into next season. Uh, and they're a team that I think is going to actually be come pretty dangerous quickly. I like what Duarte is shown to be this year. I've still got questions about what he's going to be long-term in his NBA career. Uh, but they're very, very well set uh, for the future. And this pick is going to complement it even more because I'm going with A.J. Griffin here, forward out of Duke. I've been talking about him as a guy I could see going in the top five. And finally, here he is, fifth overall. Athletically, he's a beast. Uh, you know, has that six foot eight wing uh, or six foot eight frame. Also, someone who probably has a seven foot wingspan and is, is in an NBA ready body. I'm very impressed with this young man. Uh, he's starting to put together some really good performances as well, putting up over 20 points a game in multiple games now in the past couple of weeks for Duke. Uh, and we're finally seeing the potential kind of come to fruition with some of that success there at Duke. Now, with our next selection, we have the San Antonio Spurs, and this is the highest we've ever seen them select in our entire lifetime. It's really weird to see them as high as sixth overall. Uh, this is a team that has an all-time great coach. Uh, you know, the roster-wise, they, they're trying to make a little bit of a transition, trying to retool it, figure it out. Uh, Sheldon, who's the best fit for the Spurs at six? The Spurs here have a lot of options. The nice thing is they're another big-time trade deadline winner because they were able to bring in not just one, but two extra first-round picks for this year's draft. It gives them a ton of flexibility. They could potentially move this pick up if they did want to when we get to the actual uh, closer date to the NBA draft. But here, I mean, Jalen Duran is just the obvious selection. Jakob Perto was on the trade block. They couldn't find a deal for him. I thought potentially he would have gotten traded to Charlotte. I thought the Raptors would have been in play for him. They decided to hold on to him. But realistically, Jalen Duran's the guy who could really change this franchise long-term because of his athleticism at the center position. He's more fluid in the hips than a guy like Jakob Perto. He can guard out on the perimeter, can protect the rim. He's also very, very athletic. He has pretty solid playmaking feel. Uh, as well in the pick and roll game. And, and ultimately the athleticism is what keeps him here in the top 10. Absolutely. And now we look at the Sacramento Kings. Sacramento, you know, made a bold decision, traded for Sabonis. 
Um, some people like it, some people don't. Uh, looking at where they're at now, is there a player on the board that you could see as a perfect fit with this roster? Or is this getting kind of clunky now in Sacramento? Uh, I think there's a few guys here. I think they would consider Johnny Davis, who is a really good player out of Wisconsin. And I also think they're going to look at Ben Matherin out of Arizona. Those are two of the guys here that I'm looking at between that uh, six to 10 range that are going to be phenomenal home run picks for teams. I think Ben Matherin uh, could really project to be a guy like Mikhail Bridges. And that's why I have them going with here simply because he's long armed can defend on the perimeter. He's starting to take the challenge of guarding on ball a little bit more, but he can also be a very good gap defender for an NBA team. Choose the three ball well, plays exclusively off the ball essentially right now at Arizona, but has shown signs of when he does have the ball in his hands can make stuff happen. Uh, I really like what this kid can be, and I think he's a phenomenal pick for Sacramento, and I trust uh, their GM, Monty McNair, to get a pick like this done. Yeah, he's done uh, pretty well actually drafting the last couple of seasons, which is not something you're used to saying with the Sacramento Kings. I mean, he absolutely nailed it with Tyrese Halliburton. Hopefully he can make that magic happen again. At pick number nine, we have the Portland Trailblazers, another team that is fully looking to retool their roster. Uh, obviously, they've torn it apart the last couple of days, uh, making some key trades for this team. Uh, looking at what we have on the board now, Sheldon, who do you like for the Portland Trailblazers? That's going to be Johnny Davis. This is the uh, dream come true here for Portland. Uh, you move off CJ McCollum, you move off Norm Powell, and you get a player who's going to be arguably better than these guys very quickly into his career. That's Johnny Davis, a two-way guard can defend multiple positions, also really good with the ball in his hands, can be a creator. Uh, the biggest thing for him is how does his three-point shooting translate to the NBA? And um, then what does he look like as a playmaker? But when you have Damian Lillard there and you also have uh, Anthony Simons, who I think would come off the bench in this situation, you're very well set. I think Portland needs to find more of a defensive identity and Johnny Davis helps establish that there in Portland. And once again, once again here, we have Portland up. They get another opportunity here, Sheldon. What do you like? More athleticism, more players on the wing. That's Shade and Sharp. They're going to do this right here. They're going to do the opposite of what they did last time around with Dame. Uh, and that's a different GM. No longer Neil Olshay calling the shots there. And I think it's going to turn out pretty well for them. If they're able to grab a guy like Jay Shade and Sharp, assuming he stays in the draft, of course, not going to play for Kentucky this year. Uh, he has a very unique story coming out of high school, graduating in December, joining the Wildcats, and then deciding he's not going to be able to play any games this year uh, for that program. Definitely makes it difficult, but I think it takes one really good workout for him to stay in the top 10. He's someone who's going to get his head above the rim. Uh, and I think his length, athleticism, speed, quickness, uh, and verticality is really going to be uh, a dream come true for Portland. You get a talented defensive player uh, and someone who on, on offense and Johnny Davis can do a lot of things. And then you uh, double down on it, get another wing here with Shaden Sharp. Yeah, Shaden Sharp's one of those really in intriguing stories. and something that we really haven't seen uh, you know, in the history of the NBA. So really, really shocking uh, if he ends up being a top 10 overall pick. And now looking at the 10th pick, we have the New York Knicks, a team that is a little disappointing from what we saw. Julius Randle took a little bit of a step back. Uh, this team is researching for that identity. Uh, they were obviously really awesome last year. It was fun to watch this team as they grew. Tom Thibodeau did a pretty good job with them. However, they take a step back this year. I first want you to address why you think that is and can this pick help that? That's a great question, Austin. Four words for the New York Knicks and why they're not in the playoff race as of right now. And those four words are regression to the mean. They have turned back to who they are. I mean, Julius Randle was just outperforming who he is as a player. And I think the whole roster up and down was as well. Derrick Rose was having a phenomenal season last year and this year, uh, just isn't the same story for New York. I, I think everyone's taken a slight step back, back into who they really are as players, uh, and it hurt, it's hurt the team overall. And then also, I think Tom Thibodeau's lost that locker room a little bit, which makes it a tough time there in New York. But this is how Tom Thibodeau teams usually work. Happened in Minnesota, happening in New York now. And for them to try and get this right, they're going to go with a guy like Ty Ty Washington out of Kentucky. So we have back-to-back -back Kentucky Wildcats going but Ty Ty Washington, unlike Shaden Sharp, has played this year and has been phenomenal in the time he's played. He's done a ton of the ball handling, ton of the playmaking, and a good amount of the scoring as well for the Wildcats. Uh, they've had an up and down season, but uh, he's been one of the uh, consistent bright spots for them. And I think when you look at what Kentucky can be uh, or what New York can be, it's all dependent on the point guard position. They finally get it right. Ty Ty Washington's a phenomenal pickup. Is he the best playmaker in the entire country? That's a great question. I don't think so. I think Jaden Ivey with his athleticism uh, is a little bit more like intriguing with his ability to get downhill. But I think in terms of like pick and roll 
maneuvering right now, pick and roll manipulation, he's right there. At number 11, we have Washington. Washington, once again, uh, they're, they're another intriguing team. They made some moves that you know ra really raised some eyebrows, especially trading for Chris Stops. Uh, big, big movement for them, trying to appeal to keeping Bradley Beal. Uh, what player here will really help them in the long term to there's a, hold on to Bradley Beal? There, there's a few here, and, and this is one that maybe it helps them hold on to Bradley Beal, or maybe it helps bridge the gap to the era after Bradley Beal. We don't exactly know if Bradley Beal is going to want to stay long term. My guess is he opts into his player option and then potentially discusses trade options. Uh, I Right now, I think this pick gives you flexibility to go either way, which is what makes it really attractive. I'm going with guard Jaden Hardy. He's playing for the G League Ignite, and I think he's about to have a really big week ahead of him here with uh, All-Star Weekend. He's going to be participating in the NBA Rising Stars game. For the first time ever, we have uh, G League Ignite players participating in All-Star Weekend. I think it's going to be a huge platform for him to go up against some of the league's best. Remember guys like Anthony Edwards and such will be in that game. So I think uh, if he has a good performance this weekend, we could see him definitely stay up in that top 10. Right now I have him going 11th to Washington. I think he'd be a good fit. He can create for himself, can help uh, down the road create for others. I think that's really where his development project, uh, projection is gonna take him. And I think he's gonna be a really nice fit for Washington. At number 12, we have the Memphis Grizzlies and the Memphis Grizzlies have far exceeded ex expectations this year. Uh, they came in, uh, John Morant is playing like an MVP. He's been absolutely terrific. And the rest of the players on that roster are really starting to mesh. They're hitting their stride. This is a scary team when it comes down to the postseason. Sheldon, at number 12, they, they have this pick from the Lakers. Uh, where do you think that they're going to go here? They're going to go with a player who just feels like a Memphis Grizzly. And of course, there I'm talking about Keegan Murray. And I don't mean that in a negative way. I mean that in a positive way because that means he's a good player. The Grizzlies have done a phenomenal job in the last three, four years at identifying talent, bringing them in, and making their team just better. Uh, they've done a great job. Jaron Jackson Jr., John Moran, of course, is a home run. But Desmond Bain, uh, they've also hit on guys like Brandon Clark. They've done a really good job top to bottom with this roster. Pretty much every free agent signing, when you look at guys like Kyle Anderson, Tyus Jones, everything they have done has worked. Uh, and it's impressive. Zaire Williams looks like he's another hit from last year, which I was a little skeptical on because he had a really down season at Stanford. They still took the risk on him and he's paying off as well there in Memphis. This team is really, really well set up. Uh, and then they get another player who right now is one of the top scorers in the nation uh, and can play a lot of four for them, which allows them to play Jaron Jackson at the five more consistently. At number 13, we have the Atlanta Hawks. And we talk about regression of the mean. Maybe that's what happened with the Atlanta Hawks. Last year, they were phenomenal. Eastern Conference Finals. Now they are the 13th overall pick. What's the big struggle here? And can they address that? Uh, for them, it's tough because they have a ton of talent on their roster. I think uh, getting Cam Reddish out of there did help define and clear up some roles for players so that they kind of knew what was expected of them when they were on the floor, which is usually a struggle most teams don't have because they weren't as deep as what Atlanta was. Uh, and here, I think going forward, it's just about trying to find someone who can be a gap filler for this team on both ends of the floor. And there's a guy in here that I love, and that's Kendall Brown out of Baylor. Uh, I think he's one of the ultimate gap fillers in college basketball right now. He's been doing a ton for the Baylor Bears, does some ball handling, does some playmaking, uh, pretty solid defender as well, offers good length and versatility. And I think that's all what Atlanta needs at this point in the draft. The fact that they were able to get this pick does give them a lot of flexibility going into the future when it comes to contract renegotiations. At pick number 14, we have the Charlotte Hornets, a, a team that's done a really nice job comparatively from where they've been, you know, over the course of their franchise's history, but they're kind of righting some of the wrongs there with selections like LaMelo Ball. And you look at what they've built through free agency trades. I mean, they have a good roster. They're, they're definitely struggling, especially defensively this year. But when you look at pick 14, I, I think there's some talented players that can really help them steer the ship for next season. There is, and this player is going to address what they were looking for at the trade deadline which is a rim protector. Of course, they did opt for Montrose Harrell today from Washington, uh, but really I think they had their eyes set on Jakob Pertl and couldn't get it done. So what they want is a rim protector and there's no one better in the nation right now than Walker Kessler, the running mate there in Auburn with uh, Jabari Smith. He's been phenomenal. He's been a huge part of the Auburn uh, success story this season. Of course, they've been the number one team in the nation for quite some time, went on a 19 game win winning streak before that got recently snapped. Uh, by Arkansas. And I think Walker Kessler is one of those players who is going to rise up boards. This is the first time we've seen him in the lottery here at Utility Sports for a mock draft, and he deserves it. Uh, one of the best rim protectors in the nation. And I also think uh, looking at him as a sophomore, 
his transfer story, everything about him is interesting. And I think he's really unlocked his game now uh, at this point of his career, which I really like. At number 15, we once again have the Oklahoma City Thunder. Previous pick was Jaden Ivey at pick four. Now you have an opportunity potentially to address that wing spot or maybe look at another big man. What direction are you going with them? Yeah, this is an interesting spot here for Oklahoma City, just given what they do have on their roster. Uh, there's a, a ton of different things they could do. I think this is where you start to get into the point of, okay, maybe we look for fit. Maybe we look for some size and length that could complement our guard play. And for me here, the player I want to uh, tune in on is Nikola Jovic. Uh, he's a Serbian wing, six foot ten. He had a huge World Cup run uh, in the U19 World Cup, and I think that's something that's going to really help him when it comes to his NBA draft positioning. There's one thing obvious about NBA talent evaluators. They like size, they like length, and they like versatility, and he brings all of that and more. He's someone who can step out to the three-point line, comfortable handling the ball a little bit. Not going to be a point forward for you, but he can take you off the dribble. And then you also look at uh, his ability to finish around the rim. There's a ton of flexibility here that he gives, and I think he can play a little bit of the three, a little bit of the four, and helps Oklahoma City really maximize their lineups. And now at this point in the draft, we're starting to see some of the teams that exceeded expectations. The Minnesota Timberwolves are definitely one of those teams. They have a lot of talent on this roster. Anthony Edwards has taken another step forward in his career. Uh, he's getting better and better. Now, when you look at what this Minnesota Timberwolves team is, uh, you know, they're going to be likely a play-in team, and we're not exactly sure how far they can make it in the postseason. It likely won't be far considering the current roster construction. Nevertheless, they are, they are on the pathway uh, to, you know, maybe having some future success in the postseason. Uh, they had a quiet trade deadline. What are they really after in this draft? There, there's a, a few different things they could look at. And I do want to shout out Chris Finch real quick because he's turned this franchise around. Uh, he deserves a ton of credit. He deserves some recognition potentially for coach of the year as well. Uh, just given what this roster really is, he's getting a lot out of guys who we didn't expect a ton out of. I know Jared Vanderbilt is a fan favorite there in Minnesota, uh, but this is an upgrade opportunity. You go with EJ Liddell out of Ohio State. He's a potential uh, Naismith or uh, Wooden Award player of the year candidate i think he's going to be someone who if they were able to grab him at this point uh becomes a no-brainer he's a more consistent shooter uh can step out to the three-point line a better defender than vanderbilt even though vanderbilt's really good defensively and i think just someone who has a higher skill set maybe not going to be the effort guy that vando is uh, but has a really good skill set to match some of his defensive intensity at number 17 we have the houston rockets they selected von Carroll with the third overall pick now once again you know they've had a lot of first round picks over the last two years uh, what can they do here to improve this roster? Again, this is going to be another example here of GM Rafael Stone trying to help his young guards. Of course, that's Jalen Green and Kevin Porter Jr. And he's going to do that by trying to find a shooter, someone who I know a lot of people view him as a lottery pick. I don't. That is Patrick Baldwin Jr. out of Milwaukee. Uh, I think he took the easy way out playing against lesser competition this year for Milwaukee. He's had a few big games against uh, some more recognizable competition. Uh, but for the most part, I was not impressed with him by uh, the World Cup U19 uh, when he was on Team USA. Kind of played a secondary role and was looked like a second fiddle type of player. There really was limited to catch and shoot opportunities and doesn't bring you much more than that on the offensive end. Uh, and he plays pretty upright defensively as well. Those are going to be uh, th certain things that they have to target in development for him. Uh, but nonetheless, he does help them offensively by giving them a consistent floor spacer. At number 18, uh, it says the Boston Celtics, but this pick is going to San Antonio. San Antonio, once again, with another selection. Sheldon, this team is rolling in the picks. Uh, where do you think they're going? Right here, they're going to have to look for some wing play and some guard play, which I know sounds contradictory to Spurs fans because they're going to say, well, we have wings and guards, but if you've already gone with Jalen Duran this draft, what else are you supposed to do? You're not taking another center, especially while you have Jakob Pertl on the roster. What I really see is a consolidation trade for this team at some point down the road. First, I'm going here with Marjan Bochamp out of G League Ignite. He's had a really good season. He's someone whose stock has risen this year because of his performance. And I think at six foot seven, pretty decent wingspan and pretty solid NBA body, he's going to be able to come in and be a contributor early on for San Antonio, who I don't think is content with losing for a long time. At number 19, we have the Denver Nuggets, and the Denver Nuggets are going to be looking for, you know, a player that's able to consistently produce for them. They've done a really nice job drafting the last couple of seasons. Um, they've gotten creative with trades. Looking at where they're at here, who is the best contributor right away for this team? It's a guy who right now is contributing in a pro league somewhere else. Of course, that is Hugo Bassan. He's playing for the New Zealand Breakers over in the NBL, and I am in love with this guy. 
This is similar to Josh Giddy last year. I told you guys Josh Giddy was a lottery pick, and I think Hugo Basson potentially could be one as well. I have him falling to 19th here because, uh, of course, some of the trades that happen do shake up where I see players going. But Hugo Basson would be a phenomenal pickup for the Nuggets, who never, ever seemingly miss in the first round. They do a great job putting talent around Nikola Jokic, and there's not much of a better shooter in this year's class. I think he's a better shooter than Patrick Baldwin. I think he's more dynamic with the ball in his hands. Now, defensively, he's got limitations for sure. Uh, but his offensive upside is extremely high. At number 20, we have the Toronto Raptors selecting. However, this is going to San Antonio. San Antonio, once again, they get another stab at it. You, you talked about consolidation picks. Potentially, maybe they move up, package them, move up a little higher into that lottery. Uh, where do you see them at this spot? Sticking with 20 here, uh, with the fact that they grabbed uh, Jalen Duran and Marjan Beauchamp already, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go down to a guy who's way too low on this board, and that is Max Christie out of Michigan State. Uh, he's a top 20 player in this class. I like what he is. He's very consistent off the ball, keeps his hands ready as a shooter, but has also shown flashes of shot creation potential, especially one or two dribble pull-ups. He's very comfortable in the mid-range area, can break down a defender with his handle. Uh, he's going to be a consistent playmaker and scorer for himself at the NBA level. And I think San Antonio does need a little bit more of that. I think there was hopes Devin Vassell would become that. I had hoped that as well, but it's not come enough with enough regularity to save him from a pick like this. Max Christie comes in and he's hungry and uh, someone who I could see taking a starting spot quickly. At pick 21, we have your Dallas Mavericks. Uh, really good opportunity for Dallas after just trading Chris stops. I know you're really depressed about that, but maybe we can right the wrong with this selection. I am a little sad about the uh, whole Chris Stops thing for sure. I just feel like we could have done better in a trade or I felt like we would have been better off just keeping him. Uh, we decided to not do that. Uh, and now what I'm doing here is trying to build into what I think Jason Kidd's identity is gonna be as the head coach. And we're gonna go down and find a targeted player here. And that is Trace Jackson Davis, who is going to be all the way down here at 59. That ranking is terrible. That is nowhere near accurate for where he should be in this year's class. Again, he's a top 30 guy for sure. Uh, and defensively, he makes a ton of sense and offensively makes a lot of sense with Luka Doncic because what he does better than almost anyone in this class is pick and roll. And he's also someone who has pretty good playmaking feel out of the post. You can use him as a hub of the offense. A little reminiscent of DeMontis Sabonis with a, a little bit more hops. And I think the biggest thing he adds to Dallas uh, is his rim protection elements. Doesn't shoot the ball at all, but at the same time, does give you some rim protection, which I think Dallas is now extremely lacking of. Now at number 22, we have the Philadelphia 76ers, but this pick is going to Brooklyn. Brooklyn had a really nice day, obviously acquiring Ben Simmons. They get younger and maybe, you know, th this team could still make a finals run. Uh, I don't think that's out of the question. Now with pick 22, um, they did pretty well last year when they selected Cam Thomas. Looks like he will be a really, really nice player for them for years to come. Uh, and now they have another opportunity to build upon this roster. I'm glad you brought up Cam Thomas there, Austin. GM Sean Marks has done a phenomenal job guiding the ship here for Brooklyn in what has been a total remake of what this roster was five to 10 years ago. Uh, and now at this point, you look at the, their ability to also add Kessler Edwards in round two. Dayron Sharp as well was a really nice pickup for this team. And I think they keep that train rolling here with Blake Wesley out of Notre Dame. Another freshman who has signs of being able to create for himself has run more of that true point guard position for Notre Dame and he's been huge for their offense this year. Uh, and I think if Sean Marks is presented with a player who shows some uh, flashes of talent, he's gonna be willing to take that risk, especially now with James Harden out of Brooklyn. At pick 23, we have the Chicago Bulls. Once again, the Chicago Bulls have been playing very, very well so far this season. Uh, there's some opportunity, however, to get better with this roster as everybody does. Uh, talk about why they've made such a jump this year, aside from just DeMar DeRozan. DeMar DeRozan, of course, is the, is the big player there. I'm glad you mentioned that. But I think what it is, is part of it's Billy Donovan's system, how well he utilizes guards. And I think another part of it is how well Arturis Karnisovic put together this team from an offensive and defensive blend standpoint. You have really good offensive players in Nikola Vucevic, DeMar DeRozan, Zach Levine. But then he also used some of his cap space and flexibility to bring in really good defensive players. You look at uh, Lonzo Ball, Alex Caruso, those two are going to be the ones that uh, get a lot of that credit there. But then you also have Patrick Williams, who I know has been injured, but I think he's going to be a huge piece defensively for them as well. And even guys like Javante Green, uh, they've stepped up, played well for him, and it, it pays off and it turns into wins. But I think here what you're looking at is trying to find a little bit more size, length, and rim protection if you are Chicago, someone to back up more consistently than Tony Bradley, 
uh, for Nikola Vucevic, and that's going to be Mark Williams out of Duke. He's the third Duke player to go now in the top 23 picks. Uh, very athletic, and I think his sophomore season has set him apart from some of the other bigs uh, where he's worth a first-round pick at this point. 24, we have the Indiana Pacers previously selected. Uh, A.J. Griffin with the fifth overall pick. You had mentioned him being in that range. Uh, at 24, Indiana can really build upon you know what's been a nice trade deadline and draft. Where do they go here with the selection? I think they go for a player who screams potential, and that's Dyson Daniels here out of G League Ignite. A six foot five guard can handle the basketball and can facilitate to others. Now his efficiency splits are extremely low, and I don't think he necessarily has the shot creation potential that a guy like Jaden Hardy has, which is why Hardy goes in the lottery and Dyson Daniels does not for me. Uh, but I do think what he could be is a really nice backup to Tyrese Halliburton to keep their pick and roll offense alive. And I think I'm hoping that Rick Carlisle has learned from the past that he needs another playmaker to come in off the bench uh, and keep his offense uh, alive and well. And I think that Tyrese Halliburton is going to be huge for their starting lineup. And I think Dyson Daniels comes in and is an extremely good backup point guard early in his career. At pick 25, we have the Memphis Grizzlies. Uh, they had selected Keegan Murray with that 12th overall pick. Once again, they can really build upon some depth. A team that already has a lot of depth to begin with. Uh, now they get another chance at it in that Utah deal. Uh, so we're, with where they're at now, uh, who is the best fit for this roster? Another player here who feels like a Grizzlies player. That's Kennedy Chandler, and that's because he's pesky. He's someone who, uh, at his size, six foot one, maybe a little undersized, which pulls him down the board a little bit here. I know going 25th overall is fairly low for him, but I think it's a real possibility on draft night that that's what happens. Uh, but he's extremely pesky, uh, and he's quick as well. And I think that's what makes him worth the first round pick is he's going to be able to get in the passing lanes. He's going to be a disruptor defensively. He's willing to pick up 94 feet and then offensively as well, can get downhill, can play make for others. Uh, I think he has a pretty good blend. He kind of reminds me of Rajon Rondo a little bit, not quite the facilitator that Rondo was in his time in Boston, uh, but still a real, really good pickup here for uh, Memphis, who is looking for a little bit of versatility long-term for that backcourt. At number 26, we have the Milwaukee Bucks. The Milwaukee Bucks, the defending champs, what do they have to do to defend their title? Obviously, they made some moves uh, at the deadline here. I mean, DiVincenzo out. You insert a guy like Serge Ibaka as well. This is going to take a little bit to regain that chemistry, but what do you think they can do in the draft? I think on draft night, this will be a pick that they do look to trade potentially for uh, a veteran player. But if they do hold on to it here, I would like them to go with the guy uh, who kind of screams Chris Middleton to me, and that's Bryce McGowan, freshman out of Nebraska. He's a six foot seven guard can shoot it on the move. Now his efficiencies are extremely low this year at college level, uh, kind of like what we saw with Zaire Williams last year. And he's not gonna be the playmaker that Zaire Williams is or quite the athlete, but I do think what he can be uh, is a really good shot creator with size at the two guard position, able to break guys down and get to his spots. And that's gonna be extremely valuable uh, as a development piece, especially after they moved on from Dante DiVincenzo during the trade deadline. At 27, we have the Miami Heat who generally do a really nice job developing uh, players that not aren't necessarily lottery selections. They'd like to do it with later round picks and also undrafted guys. They do a really great job with scouting out. Uh, is there a player here that's maybe slipped through the cracks that they're going to be, you know, just salivating to get their hands on? I, I think with what they have on their roster, it seems like they have a ton of good guards that they've been able to uh, progress and develop over time. I think what they need is another NBA ready body at the forward group. And that's going to be Trevor Keels from Duke, the fourth Duke, Blue Devil to go in the first round in this draft. They're extremely deep and talented again this year. Uh, and Trevor Keel is someone who doesn't really blow you away on film, but just does a bunch of things right. And I think that really fits well into Miami in a complimentary role. He can come off the bench next to Tyler Hero, and you can implement him into lineups to help defensively alongside Duncan Robinson as well. I think this gives Eric Spolster a little bit more versatility, especially on the defensive end of the floor. At pick 28, Memphis Grizzlies again. We talk about consolidation sometimes when you have a, a roster as talented as it is, sometimes you want to consolidate and maybe just get the best prospect available. Is that on the table in your mind when the draft comes? Yes, it is here for Memphis. The fact that this is their third first round pick, it's extremely, extremely difficult to know uh, what they could look to add because they're so deep everywhere. They don't really need a ton of stuff. So the fact that this is their third first round pick, they're going to go for potential here. Jean Montero uh, out of overtime elite. He's playing in a league where there's not a ton of help defense right now. Uh, and I think is a league that I don't think really proves what he could be as a pro player. But what he does have is ball handling skills. He can get downhill. He has a flair for playmaking. 
Uh, and he's also someone who has some shot creation potential to him. So I think there is some long-term upside with him. They just have to uh, improve for sure. Now we have the Golden State Warriors who are looking as dangerous as, as any time we've seen them um, aside from the Kevin Durant era, but this team's really talented. Andrew Wiggins has looked really good. Jonathan Kaminga is finally starting to come around. Uh, it's exciting for the future of this team. You know, a lot of people thought they'd be done once Clay and, and Steph were gone, Draymond as well, but it looks like the next era, next era for the Warriors is looking really, really bright. It is for sure. And they're going to add even more athleticism to that young group here with a guy like J.D. Davison who falls a little bit. I, I like J.D. Davison. Uh, I think 29 is pretty low for him, but it comes down to really what teams are looking for and how they evaluate fit. And I think uh, for him, he's someone who would thrive in a motion offense because I don't think he's a, a great one-on-one -on -one creator, but I think when there's equal opportunity offense and the ball is moving for him, it helps him get downhill and helps him use that athleticism in the half court a little bit more. I think he does give a little bit of a nice wrinkle to them in transition as well with his speed and also his verticality uh, and his ability to attack the rim. Uh, he's been fun to watch this year uh, and at the very least becomes a, a solid backup point guard option for Golden State. And finally, to conclude pick 30, we had the Oklahoma City Thunder already have made two selections on a roster full of young players. Uh, when you look at what Oklahoma City has done so far, what do you like and what are you concerned about with having these three picks? The, the thing I like here is it gives you flexibility. Uh, and of course, it's going to be huge on draft night if they can move up to pick or on lottery night, if they can move up to pick one or two potentially uh, to get a guy like Jabari Smith, who kind of maybe fits their roster a little bit better than what Jaden Ivey does. Uh, but nonetheless, getting Jaden Ivey is huge for them. Uh, it's all about talent acquisition right now. And then here's another pick where they're looking for some fifth. And for me, that's going to be Israel uh, Ismael Kamagate here. He's an intriguing center. I know uh, he's definitely growing, going up some boards as of right now. He was in last year's draft, withdrew closer to the end of the process, and I think uh, has shown some real signs of improvement playing overseas. Uh, better rim protector than he was last season. I think that's really where he brings some value for Oklahoma City. And finally, looking at the final draft results, a lot of great players went off the board. Now tell me of all of these selections, what player do you think on here was undervalued in terms of you know where you think the NBA circles are standing with a certain player? Uh, I think probably Hugo Basson, to be honest. And I know that seems crazy right now because a lot of other people don't even see him as a first round pick. I'm telling you guys, I'm ahead on him. He is a first round level player and he I think he's a lottery level player. Uh, he's a phenomenal shooter. He's doing a ton right now for the New Zealand Breakers in the NBL. Uh, and it's pretty frequent when there's a guy who oversees a lot of veteran players in a pro league, trust a 20 year old to be handling the basketball and making decisions uh, and really helping the team win. That means he's good. Uh, and I think he's gonna be really good in the NBA with more spacing uh, and a little bit better uh, rules about contact. I think it's gonna help his game thrive even more. Thanks everybody for tuning in. Subscribe to the channel if you are new. We push out a lot of NBA draft content and NBA content in general. So if you are a fan of that, hit that subscribe button. Also leave a like if you did enjoy this video. Let us know in the comments section below who was the best pick of this first round. Thanks for stopping by and we'll catch you in the next video.